copyright disclaimer under the section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976, allowances made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by a copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing nonprofit educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Salam alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. You know, the enemy has caused a lot of confusion throughout the earth, okay? They cause a lot of wars, a lot of damage, and they cause a lot of harm throughout the earth. So in Pakistan now, they have basically essentially um, colonized Pakistan after, after World War II, correct? Like, like every other, all these nation states, they basically came around World War I, World War II. And after that, there was a, a massive war, I believe in the 70s, between what was known as East Pakistan and West Pakistan, right? West, uh, I believe East Pakistan now is, um, is uh, Bangladesh, and then you have Pakistan now, right? I believe that's, that's how it works. But anyways, it was a brutal war. It was a brutal, brutal, brutal war. And many of these, um, what is now known as East Pakistani women, which is now known as Bangladesh, many of them were raped. They got pregnant. They have like hundreds of thousands of, of these, these babies that were sent up to adoption in the West from, from the rape that was happening at, in these times. And I, I, when I was in high school, I met one of these kids who, who was, uh, you know, a child of, of child product of the rape between that war. Right? I used to go to school with him. Right, his name was O'Neill. Right, but but I'm young back then. I didn't really understand, you know, all this geopolitics and everything like that. But the point is, is that this conundrum or this this situation is not a unique situation concerning the enemy. They've done this throughout the entire earth. And they've built this system and it was designed to pit brother against brother. Are you feeling me? So just like white supremacist devils did in the Congo, they pit brother against brother. And just like they did in Nigeria, they pit brother against brother. And just like they did in Yemen, they pit brother against brother. And just like they did in Somalia, they pit brother against brother. And just like they did in Korea, they pit brother against brother. And just like they did in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Mali, in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Venezuela, in Colombia, in every nation where there are darker skinned people on earth, they pit brother against brother. They plant the seed of evil with their forked tongues and global monetary planning under the guise of lending the, his slimy helping hand to the so-called underdeveloped nations. Then when he causes all the chaos and funds his destruction, he puts his one bloody hand behind his back and wags his finger in your face, talking about, you see, your people are too uneducated, too uncivilized, too un overpopulated to ever, ever, ever make progress. Do you think they sit in peace and comfort in every imperialistic, colonizing, white supremacist nation because they're educated and civilized? Is that what you believe? Who educated these cavemen in the first place? It was the Moors. It was black African Muslims who taught them how to bathe, how to wash, science, math, and every other science for over 800 years. And when they cause all that chaos in your countries, you flee your countries to come here, work hard under his system, 
to make them rich and talk about how superior their system is compared to Islam. And then you expect them to respect you when they beat you up or cause the conditions to put brother in, against brother in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Somalia, in Syria, and in, in wherever it is. They buff you up over there and you come over here. They buff you up over here and you ask them for protection. And these so-called Muslim organizations, after that terrorist attack, that's exactly what they did. And the Muslims act accordingly. Because you are so afraid for a terrorist label to be put on you. Like I said in the beginning, language is important. You're so afraid for that terrorist label to put be put on you, you won't even defend a masjid. Three men and a man and a woman, you can't, you can't defend the masjid. You can't do it. One man with a knife in the masjid, you can't defend the masjid. You have to call the police. How many women in Edmonton now being beat up and brutalized in Edmonton? Women, where are the men? Rama Muhammad thinks a lot about staying safe. Sometimes it's hard for me to say if I'm walking into a space, if I'm getting stares because I'm black or because I'm Muslim or because I'm woman, or is it all of those things that are triggering the person? Her fear all the more tangible now. Tuesday, Edmonton police arrested a 32-year-old woman and charged her with the assault of a black woman wearing a hijab on a transit platform. A week earlier, police arrested a 41-year-old man after he attacked two black women wearing hijabs as they were sitting in their car in a shopping mall parking lot. In the 10 years between 2009 and 2018, according to Statistics Canada, there were 127 police-reported hate crimes directed at Muslims in Alberta. And the trend is rising. Almost 50 were in the final two years. Muslim women in Alberta are exhausted. It has definitely been a, hor a horrifying and traumatizing experience for the Muslim community at large. In recent months, black Muslim women wearing hijab in Edmonton and Calgary have been targets in a series of racist attacks. In December, a mother and daughter were violently assaulted in an Edmonton Mall parking lot. Less than a week later, another woman was attacked at a city transit station. And just last weekend, a 28-year-old woman was charged after a racially motivated assault on a teenage girl. Police say the woman yelled racist slurs, kicked and punched the girl, and removed her hijab. These seven attacks on Muslim women um, showcase how large of an issue it is. Not even a week after a Muslim family was killed in London, Ontario, the Somali community here in Edmonton is reporting yet another hate-motivated attack. They say a black hijabi woman was walking in her north side neighborhood last Friday when she was attacked from behind. And she was just walking around to get a fresh air when all of a sudden someone grabbed her by the neck and threw her into the ground. Uh, while she was just trying to collect herself, they were gone already. Jabril Ibrahim is a leader in the Somali community. He saw the victim Sunday. He tells City News she's not up for an interview while she recovers from the trauma. Her face still you know, swollen. Uh, you know, uh, some of the teeth are loose and also there's a crack on her nose. A spokesperson for Edmonton Police say the attack happened around 9 Friday evening in the area of 144 Avenue and 90th Street, adding the incident remains under investigation. However, they would not confirm if this attack was hate-motivated. The Somali community believes it is. What else would it be if she was wearing hijab, right, and she was walking on the street and things have been happening? What else, do you, you know, can we call it? Since December, there have been a number of police-reported hate-motivated attacks in the city. In March, an Edmonton man was charged in connection to three incidents. However, Abraham says there have been many more incidents that go unreported, fearing further risk to their safety. Where are the men to protect their women, Somalian women? Where are they? You can't do it because in your mind, the enemy is supposed to protect you because you don't see the enemy as an enemy. And it's embarrassing. And not only is it embarrassing, it's extremely dangerous. Now, I want to leave you with one more thing to show you how deep this thing goes. 
and how inappropriate these groups act. Remember what I was saying about Pakistan, correct? The Pakistani prime minister right now, his name is Imran Khan. Okay, and I want to play something for you. Uh, you tweeted about the, the killing of the four members of the Afzal family this week. Why did you want to speak out about it, sir? Well, listen, uh, Rosemary, I have spent a lot of my time in Western countries. I have uh, spent half my, I used to, when I used to play professional cricket, I used to spend half my year in, in England. I went to university there. I got married there. I got boys there. So I understand the Western culture. And I also, I understand um, wh where the problems are. How come this Islamophobia is growing and specifically after 9-11. There are two landmark uh, dates from where Islam, uh, Islamophobia has grown. One was Salman Rushdie's book in 1989, roughly. And secondly, it was after 9-11. And how did, how did this division, the suspicion take place? After 9-11, the word Islamic terrorism, Islamic radicalism, now, when these terms started uh, becoming currency and announced by Western leaders, the man in the street does not understand. When you say Islamic radicals, uh, it seems that there's something in the religion that makes people radical. And the man in the street cannot distinguish between a moderate Muslim and a radical Muslim. Terrorism has no religion. They are, in every human society, they're extremists. Uh, they are liberals, they are extremists, and bulk of the people are moderates. Well, I was just going to say, though, you, you've talked about this at the United Nations and, and many other places, about a need for a holistic approach by the international community. What, what does that mean to you practically, Prime Minister? What do you need to see there? So my whole, I've been, uh, every forum, uh, I've been trying to say this because the two, you know, communities, Muslims living in Western world, they are the ones who suffer from Islamophobia. And then they suffer. I mean, uh, regular, uh, we, we hear about incidents. A lot of incidents don't get reported, but we know about it. Our embassies tell us. So, so this, this gap needs to be closed. In this instance, it appears it was uh, one person uh, radicalized in some way on his own who did this. W what is it that government should be doing, for instance, to shut down online hate toward Muslims? I think there should be a very strict action against it, this. Because, you see, these uh, hate uh, websites, which, which, again, as I said, would divide, divide humanity by creating hatred, ignorant about the other human community, and you, you target them and, and, and uh, uh, this hate material, and especially with the growing social media, uh, and social media is, a, is a completely, you know, the world is just coming to grips with it because it's a new phenomenon. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I mean, while, while there are so many benefits of social media, it's changing the whole world. But this one particular bit, when there are these hate websites, which, uh, which create hatred amongst human beings, there should be an international action against them. You, you, you may be aware, too, of a law in the province of Quebec here that bans public servants, teachers, judges, and others from wearing visible religious symbols, which obviously affects Muslims who wear the hijab, for instance. Quebec says this is a law about secularism. What do you make of that kind of law existing in, in Canada? I find this, you know, secular extremism. It really is uh, against... You see, the whole idea about the idea behind secularism is liberalism. You want humans to basically, uh, you know, be free to express the way they want to be, as long as it doesn't cause pain and hurt to other human beings. You know, that's how I understood, uh, understand what liberalism is. So if someone covers their hair, uh, their head, why has it become such a big issue? And I feel this is just a symptom. The, the, the main reason behind this becoming such a ish, big issue is because of the way Islam is perceived. And that's why that understanding has to take place. And I also say one thing, Rosemary, that Muslim world also must, uh, heads of Muslim states, must be able to present their cases in world forums like the United Nations and the European Union. 
so that so so to improve this understanding and i actually do you know people objecting to hijab uh, or you know sometimes i mean people with beards all the beards are now becoming very trendy all the shorter ones so uh, people objecting to this is quite bizarre for me because you know in again i repeat in the liberal western democracies why is this such a big issue unless the reason behind it is that there's actually fear of, of the other there's a suspicion you know they actually do believe that there's something in islam that leads to radicalism and to extremism and to terrorism and unfortunately i repeat again there are certain Western leaders who believe this. Okay, family. So Prime Minister Imran Khan gave his ideas of what should be done to curb Islamophobia. And this is in response to the events that happened in London, Ontario. So he basically said that there should be very strict international action against online hate. He also said in response to what's happening in Quebec, Canada, a province out here, the French province. He said that anti-hijab laws became an issue because of the way that Islam is being perceived. So he's essentially saying that he wants Islam to be perceived in a positive light. And he also said that Muslim heads of state must be able to present their cases to world forums like the UN. So I want you also to take note of the amount of finger wagging he did against Western nations. Now, Listen to this question here. You, you are speaking about Islam writ large, of course, but as you know, it, it is very diverse. There are many different groups of Muslims in the world. You have previously said, sir, that you are not aware of events happening in Xinjiang province in China. Canada's parliament has said what, what's happening to the Muslim minority Uyghurs there is a genocide. Why do you not advocate for those Muslims as you do for Muslims elsewhere? Whoa, 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 whoa. Did y'all hear that? Did y'all hear that? The Canadian government has said that what's happening to the Uyghurs in China is a genocide. You're the Pakistani prime minister. Why haven't you called out China? This white woman from Global Global News. Okay? Walaikum salam to Labrakatu. This white woman from Global News is calling out the Pakistani Prime Minister. What? What did the Pakistani Prime Minister do? I don't know. But I bet you it's gonna be sound like a whole bunch of tap dancing. Listen. Uh, let me just uh, be clear, uh, Rosemary. Number one. Islamophobia does not affect us Muslims living in Muslim countries. It only affects Muslim in Western countries. And because I know and spend time in Western uh, um, society, I understand what they go through. So that's why I raise my voice. Now, as for what is the situation of Muslims all over the world, you know, I mean, just look at the situation from Libya, you go, come to Syria, to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to Somalia. I mean, so there is a serious political problem in the Muslim world uh, and, and suffering. Yeah. You see all the tap dancing he did? Did he, did he answer the question, family? Did he answer the question? Some of y'all Muslims, you like to talk about the, the king of Saudi Arabia. And what do I always say to y'all Muslims? Don't get into the politics of the Muslim countries. Don't do it. Why? Because of this stuff right here. Us in the West, us black people in the West, we know what white people's black people look like, what they sound like, their actions. And we also know when we come into Islam, what white people's Muslim leaders look like too. Are you hearing me? That's why you rarely, rarely, rarely find black people t getting involved in the politics of Muslim countries because we know what's up. We already know. Some of your Pakistanis got nothing good to say about Saudi Arabia and nothing bad to say about your own Pakistani prime minister. 
Who did this man marry? Who was his first wife? Who was Imran Khan's first wife? Who's Jemima Goldsmith? This man married the enemy, okay? Married. Not just any enemy. The Jewish, British Jewish enemy. Making kids with the enemy. And y'all voted him to be your prime minister. You think this could ever happen? Somebody write in the chat, black people don't do that, please. Somebody write in the chat, black people don't do that. Please. Now he gets put on blast. He got all this work for Canada and Western countries and Islamophobia in Western countries. But when it comes to the Uyghurs in China, he can't even answer the question. Are you hearing me? Language is impor important. Language is important. When you hear people speaking like this, they don't have the best interest of Muslims at hand. They have the best interest of the enemy at hand. That's why Daniel Hikachu can say George Floyd died of a fentanyl drug overdose, not from being strangled. And you go for it. Black people don't go for it. You, you, you from the South, the South Asian Muslim community, the Arab Muslim, you guys go for it. Because you don't know what subversion looks like. You don't even know who, you can't even um, call the enemy an enemy. You're so impressed. All this work that Daniel Hagikachu puts in in the LGBTQ community, always talking about LGBTQ, all the twitching and twirling and 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 cricking his neck for, for Donald Trump that he does, and none of you can call him out? Not a single one of you? Somebody say the devil's a liar. Put in the chat, please, the devil's a liar. Somebody put in the chat, the devil's a liar, please. Just lying. Lying. He, it's impossible for him to be mistaken. Maybe he made a mistake. Maybe, maybe he said that George Floyd died of fentanyl by mistake. Maybe he was mistaken. No, he was lying. And the reason why he's lying... It's because he's a white supremacist. Are you hearing me? That's why he's lying. And just like he is working for the enemy, Daniel Hikikichu, so are your Muslim leaders. And that's why it's better you don't talk about any of them. This is the Pakistani prime minister trying to defend the family that was killed in London, Ontario. That's him. Ex-husband to Jemima Goldsmith. Thank you. The devil's a liar. That's right. Somebody put in the chat. The devil's a liar. Please. 